Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Jordan Tagani. I'm the director of product management of, uh, of, for Google BigQuery. I was also one of the first engineers on Google BigQuery, so I know where a lot of the uh, <coughs> skeletons are hidden in the, in the code, uh, or at least I still remember some of it. So a, a data warehouse is a, is a tool. It's a, it's a tool that can be used um, in, uh, uh, in, in, a lot of, in a lot of ways, but it's a relatively simple tool. Um, and you know, like, like simple tools, you can build some, some really uh, impressive things. This is my house uh, in, in Seattle. Um, and you can build this house with very simple tools. But if you want to build a skyscraper, you need totally different tools. So what, is, what are the difference? It's, it's scale, it's, uh, it's, it's technology, and it's, and it's use cases. Um, and so a data warehouse is, 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 is similar. Uh, so a traditional data warehouse um, is, a, is a fairly simple tool. It's been around for 30, 40 years in pretty much the same, the same format. How many people here have a, have a data warehouse that they, that they run? So lots of you. Actually, for how many of those people have a data warehouse that's not BigQuery? I just want to see if I'm preaching to the choir here. Okay, so like we, folks do have lots of data warehouses that's not BigQuery. Um, but of those people that have, have data warehouses, that aren't BigQuery. How many of you run either Hadoop or Spark or Impala uh, or something, something like that as well? So lots of people are, are running things that are data analysis tools that are outside of their data warehouse. So the data warehouse is, is, is clearly missing something. Um, and how many of you run sort of, some sort of Kafka or streaming analytics? So a, lot, a bunch of those. And how many of those are integrated with your data warehouse? So not, not too many. So there's, there's, there's clearly also a real-time real -time component that, uh, that, that people want or people, people have, um, have streaming data that's coming in. So kind of the way we see data warehousing at, at Google is it starts with the data warehouse. Um, the data warehouse, you know, as actually one of the, the guys from Home Depot said uh, a couple weeks ago, um, you know, 99.9% .9 of all this, of all the you know traditional data warehousing stuff, it's still relevant. So I'm not going to try to say that these you know old traditional data warehousing isn't relevant. It is, but um, you know it's there's something more. There's something more that people want, and uh, you know so Google's data warehouse is is BigQuery. Um, you know, hopefully people have heard of it by now, um, and it's our it's our enterprise data warehouse uh, for for analytics. Uh, we used to call it petabyte scale. Now we call it exabyte scale, um, in case you're tracking these these uh, these slides over time. Um, and you can run petabyte scale queries, and I'll show you one of those uh, in a few minutes. Uh, security is super important for us, so all your data is stored encrypted, durably available, and I'll get into some of the other properties uh, as I as I go along. Um, you know, you don't have to just take my word for it. You know, Forrester named named BigQuery a leader in their uh, their cloud data warehousing. Uh, wave, and um, w you know we recently um, had a study out from ESG that said, you know, using BigQuery as a traditional data warehouse uh, gives you significant savings over uh, over on other on-prem data warehouses. Um, I also want to highlight something that that was. Uh, that, we, that we've announced uh, at, at Next. Uh, Sudhir mentioned it in his talk, talk yesterday. But so a lot of people that I've, I've been, been meeting with over the last few, uh, few days have been saying, like, we love BigQuery, but we want, f we want uh, predictable pricing. And, but you know, $40,000 a month that we charge for, for 2,000 slots is, is out, of their, out of their price range. Uh, and you know, so we've, we're announcing you know, 500 slots uh, for, for $10,000 per month. Um, hopefully, there's a lot more people that, um, for whom that's in their in their their price range. Um, so one of the kind of key things for, for for data warehousing when you're moving to the cloud is the separation of storage and compute. Um, you know, when when Home Depot moved to to BigQuery, they um, they had a hundred terabytes in an on-prem data warehouse. Um, just recently, they finished their migration uh, to to BigQuery. And now they've got uh, tens of petabytes, so huge, huge amounts of data, um, and it's, 
you know, it's not something that's new. It's that this data was always coming in, but they were, they were constrained by the environment that they were working in. And so when you, when you go to the cloud, you remove a lot of the, a lot of the constraints. You can, scale up, you can scale up the storage amounts, you know, virtually, um, virtually infinitely. You can scale up the, the compute amounts to, to tens or even hundreds of thousands of CPU cores. Um, so, you know, we're, we've also kind of announced that, you know, where we talk about some of our, our big statistics, you know, we have customers that have a quarter exabyte of, uh, of, of data for a single customer, and we do run, run queries uh, that, are, that are over a petabyte um, relatively frequently. Um, so this is the, uh, the, the retailer that I mentioned. So uh, three years ago at, at GCP Next, I... Um, I introduced this petabyte data set that, um, that we had that, uh, and I ran a query over this petabyte data set and I kind of did this thing where I, you know, at the beginning of the talk, I started it running and at the end of the talk, I said, let's, let's see how it's doing. And it took, um, it took about, about four minutes to complete. Then uh, last, last summer at, uh, at GCP Next, I, I ran that same query again with, um, against that same, uh, that same data set and uh, it was down to uh, it was down to a minute and a half, so you know two two x performance improvement. The big difference between those two actually was not the performance difference. It was if you look to the right, it says that one that one had to process all 1.09 petabytes. The latter one only had to process half a gigabyte. So um, if we can switch over to the demo, please. So I'm going to try the, running this query again. And, um, and let's see how we do. So, um, you know, the difference between the, the half, a beta, half, a, half a gigabyte and the single petabyte was that, um, you know, we, we enabled clustering. And so clustering enables you to, um, to find data much more quickly. So, so there we go, 11.7 uh, seconds uh, for, uh, to, to do this uh, scan of a, a one petabyte table. Um, I'm hoping that by next time we'll get that down to one second, but... Uh, <laughs> Can we switch back, please? So that's a challenge for the, uh, the engineering team to, uh, to, to, get, to, to, to make me look good uh, next year uh, by getting that to a second. Um, so the, the last kind of bit in the kind of the, the traditional data warehouse space where you're just sort of expanding the traditional data warehouse is, uh, is serverless. You know, nobody wants to manage servers. Um, you know, the, if you can get somebody else to keep your, keep your service running, then, um, uh, then that's great. And you know, BigQuery does you know automatic uh, automatic um, uh, patching. You know, there's no downtime when we when we uh, launch new launch new versions. We just sort of rolled that out seamlessly. Um, this was a quote from uh, from last week, actually. One of our one of our uh, more colorful uh, Australian uh, customers. Uh, you know, just mentioned that, you know, one day things started getting much faster. And so he had this to say on, on Twitter. Um, so what, you know, what kind of, what makes BigQuery BigQuery, what makes it work? Um, it's really the architecture that, um, that we build on, that, uh, that Google has, the infrastructure that, uh, you know, we really can stand on the shoulders of, of giants, the, uh, the extremely fast petabit network, um, our, our highly scalable uh, storage systems, highly scalable um, uh, compute clusters as well. <clears throat> so with serverless, you get to focus on what's important to you. You get to focus on uh, actually doing your analytics. You don't have to focus on configuration management, reliability, uh, et cetera. So next is real time, and I think real time is an underappreciated, uh, underappreciated side of, of data warehousing. Traditionally, people, you know, you get, um, you take your operational data warehouse and you, you, uh, you know, overnight you dump that into your your there's your operational database. Overnight you dump that into your 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 data warehouse and you you know you build reports and then the next morning you know you everybody comes and looks at the reports of what happened yesterday. But people don't want to see what happened yesterday. They want to know what's going on right now. Um, the the amount of data that is being that is being created is uh, you know you know 
people always talk about you know the uh, how much uh, how fast data is coming in and how hard it is to process um, and more and more that data is is streaming oriented and when you think of it like really all data is generated one event at a time it's really naturally in its natural format it's a it's a stream so across Google and across across Google Cloud and, and data analytics we really want to make it possible to to keep data in its natural form, to keep data, if it's a stream, um, to keep it as a stream. That's why Cloud Dataflow has, um, you know, with one line of code, you can switch back and forth between, between batch and streaming. And BigQuery, um, we are investing heavily in, in, in batch, or sorry, streaming analytics. Um, so one of our customers is, uh, is Zulily, and you know, they, uh, they have like these sort of daily deals. I think they have like 100, 100 new products a day. And they want to know how those products are doing throughout the day, because if they have to wait until tomorrow to get their report, then it's too late to do anything about it. So you know, they actually use streaming uh, into BigQuery, and they send you know, an hourly report that's read by all their executives, and they are able to make, make changes on the fly. So it's super powerful to be able to, to, uh, to make changes on the fly. So I'm going to show a demo of some, some high volume streaming. So like, uh, you know, in the past, people have people have kind of uh, run into some of the some streaming limits uh, in in BigQuery. Let me just start this, um, and uh, and we're we're constantly working on on kind of breaking through those limits. And I think if if you kind of think about you know limits you hit, quotas you hit, uh, kind of one overarching thing is is like you can be sure we're working on on making those limits not actually hard limits anymore. So we, we put together this streaming demo using Dataflow. So we're, um, we're using uh, thousands of workers in Dataflow. And so here's one of the, or here's the Dataflow instance that's, you can see how many bytes written. So it's, and this has only been running for a couple of hours. So that's, uh, that's some pretty, pretty significant amount of, of data. Um, now I'm looking, going into the, the compute engine instances. So we have 10 of these running. And let's check out the monitoring. Yep. There we go. Check out the monitoring. Check out the network bytes. So each one of these 10 is, is doing about, about, uh, about two gigabytes per second. So we're streaming at 20 gigabytes per second, and if you don't believe me, if we, we'll, we can look at this um, this BigQuery uh, table into which we're streaming. So this is looking at the um, the 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 data that's coming in over the last 20 minutes, and we're computing the byte length and the number of rows per second. So we're sending um, 22, 23 gigabytes per second, and um, uh, 2.3 million rows per second, so kind of kind of decent kind of decent velocity, um, but you know okay you know perhaps lots of systems can handle can handle that that sort of scale, um, you know but we we want real time we want to be able to we want to be able to do something and and see that it happens immediately. So what we're simulating here is a sensor network. So let's say we have um, you know IoT devices they're all around the world, and these sensors are you know, so we're looking at what's happened in the last in the last 10 minutes. In the last 10 minutes, we have um, all of these sensors that are reporting that they're happy. Um, now let's inject let's inject an unhappy sensor. So I'm basically just piping this into um, into BigQuery via our streaming API and our command line client. Um, and now we're looking for sensors that are not happy. So let's see uh, whether this is going to show up. Come on, unhappy sensors. I shouldn't, you know, I feel bad for the sensor that we're, we're making it unhappy, but at least it's a fake one. Um, there we go. So now we have one unhappy sensor. And uh, switch back to the uh, demo, or to the slides, please. Thanks. So real-time data warehousing, um, being able to make decisions quickly, being able to, um, to, to do things at high, high velocity, you know something that we're we're, we're pushing on. Um, another kind of important, another important thing from uh, for, for for modern data warehousing is the centralization of storage. And um, you know, uh, how many people use a data lake? 
So lots of, lots of people use a data lake. Um, you know, we believe actually it, it, that, um, so that BigQuery does an excellent job as your data lake for structured data. Um, you know, we also want to make sure that um, you can put the data where you want or, or, or how you want it. But, you know, we've done a pretty good job of, of understanding our, our structured data. Um, you know, it says the, the statistic is less than 50% of, of structured data is used to make decisions. That's a lot higher than it used to be. It's not a bad, it's not a bad number. Um, but people haven't really started looking at, at unstructured data at all. So a, a data lake is, is something that's, that's important. But we've also recently launched the BigQuery Storage API, which is a way to sort of turn the data lake upside down. It's a, it's a way to have the data lake be your, your data warehouse. And so what's the, what are the advantages of that? Well, um, you get, you know, BigQuery automatically optimizes the shape, the shape of the data. So one of the problems with the data lake is you have to optimize the number of files you have, the size of the files you have, you have to worry about consistency issues. What happens if you're running a job while you know, somebody adds or deletes, deletes a file? Um, you know, it's harder to, to apply consistent security. So you know, BigQuery lets you do DML over your, over your data. Um, it lets you uh, just have a, a higher level table abstraction. And when you have a higher level table abstraction, you can apply things like, um, like security policies and say, you know, these you know, peop, uh, that mark certain things as, certain fields as PII, so other people can't, uh, can't read them. Um, but so we have, the storage API is a way of reading at full velocity from BigQuery storage. So um, there's a data flow connector, a Spark connector, a Hive connector, um, and a data proc connector. And, um, and these will let you read in parallel uh, at, um, you know, at, you know, and scale out, you know, virtually as large as you as you want um, to make to make access by through these other processes super fast. Um, it also supports column projections and and filters, so that you know you don't have to read the full the full table. So next is next is security and trust. When when people move to the cloud, they they get nervous. They 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 feel like they've lost control of their data. You know, somebody else is managing the data. You know, maybe they. They can't fire the person who leaks the data. Um, they just there's there, and there. It's not just a, it's not just a perception problem. Like there is, you know, there are various attack vectors that, that can only happen in the cloud, and which is why, you know, Google has been um, has paying a lot of attention to 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 security and working very carefully with with customers that have significant security security needs. One of those is is HSBC. Um, you know, we worked hand in hand with them to to make them comfortable putting their data in in our cloud and and being able to rely on on the safety and security of the data in, in Google's cloud. And some of the things that you know we we developed in conjunction with them were you know customer managed encryption keys for BigQuery, um, sort of the access transparency project where you know even if an insider um, needs access to your data for support reasons that you get uh, you get detailed um, audit logs of what of what happened. Um, there's also a number of other security features that will be that are coming down down the line. Uh, next is sharing. So data that's sort of locked in a in a silo is not is not all that useful. Kind of been in the traditional data warehousing um, model, people used to um, you know only the only a select few of analysts were, were actually granted access to your uh, to, the, to the data warehouse because the data warehouse generally ran you know 100% of the time at at full capacity. You know people wanted to make sure you didn't you know you didn't lock it up, you didn't bring it down. Um, kind of when you move to the cloud and you have you know virtually unlimited capacity or scalable scalable capacity, you kind of you have the option and the ability to to grant more people access to your data. Um, so we, you know, one of the kind of the main things that we're that we're trying to do is is kind of democratize the ability to to access the data. So anybody in your organization should be able to to make make sense of the data. So whether um, you know uh, you know through like you know, so various things that we've we've announced this uh, this last couple of days with connected sheets. Connected sheets lets you. Um, uh, Anyone who can use an Excel spreadsheet can now can now use use BigQuery and can create pivot tables and um, and build reports in their in their spreadsheet um, over kind of data sizes of that are virtually virtually unlimited. 
Um, and then there's BI Engine, which is our, our, our BI tool, or sorry, which, our, which is our accelerated um, uh, engine on t that sits on top of BigQuery that powers, that can power dashboards, can power uh, Data Studio dashboards, uh, and you know, will soon power other, other partner, um, partner tools. Uh, and you know, Data Studio and the, 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 the speed and versatility of that kind of lets you, um, you know, anybody who can do you know, drag and drop in Data Studio can, can take advantage of it, and you can also share dashboards and do drill downs with, uh, you know, with, with other folks. Um, and the other, the other thing that BI Engine gets you is, is high concurrency. So it's not, just, it's not just faster, it also allows you to have your dashboards be accessed by you know, hundreds of people or thousands of people at once. Um, the, uh, we, we built a dashboard for, for March Madness to, uh, to kind of showcase the, the, um, some mach machine learning stuff that we were doing for the, the, basketball, the college basketball tournament. And you know, the dashboard was, you know, was public, and it was rendered you know, every, time, every time someone loaded the page, it ran a BI engine or a number of BI engine queries. And you know, uh, BI engine was just able to, uh, to scale uh, and, and sort of magically, magically serve that. One other nice thing for for, for, for you folks is that um, if you, when you use BI Engine, it's not, you don't get charged for a query. So uh, any, anything that hits the BI Engine in memory, in memory cache is, uh, is not charged. So you, know, you, you can buy a certain amount of memory and, um, and data will be automatically cached in that, in that memory. And then whatever, whatever we can ser s serve out of that cache uh, will, you know, will, be, will be free. Uh, but the other nice thing is that anything that misses the cache, um, you know, will be actually consistent. So, kind of the, the kind of one of the driving things for, um, uh, for for the BigQuery team is, you know, we always want to serve the freshest data. Um, and then we also just we have a lot of a lot of partner tools. Uh, you know, the the tools that you're used to investigating your data with, uh, you know, those those will work with with BigQuery. Um, so yes, I mentioned BI Engine, um, and so when we launched, uh, here's another another colorful colorful user. Uh, we launched BI Engine. Um, this was one of the first uh, things for of uh, feedback that we we got. I probably shouldn't have shown that slide, but I snuck it in at the last moment. Um, so yeah, connected sheets. Um, you know, uh, you know, we we we've you've likely seen seen before. Um, drag and drop uh, pivot tables. Uh, you know. Um, uh, and we have a number of kind of early partners that have already already been validating. Um, this is a little bit more PR ready uh, quote from uh, from a customer. Um, and the last bit of of modern data warehousing is 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 predictive. So, you know, if um, if sort of if real time data warehouse or mo traditional data warehousing lets you know what happened yesterday, real time data warehousing uh, lets you know what's happening now. Predictive data warehousing lets you know what's going to happen tomorrow. Um, what are your customers going to do? Uh, and and this, can be, this can be super powerful, and I think it's an area that has only just, just started to be, to be explored. Um, you know, in a survey, uh, you know, Forbes said that 82% um, of executives um, believe that it's, it's going to be highly impactful, but the truth is very few people are actually doing it yet. Uh, and so, you know, our, our mechanism for, for Unleashing the power of predictive analytics is is BigQuery ML, and with BigQuery ML, you just write a SQL statement, and you can build a model, uh, and you can you can run predictions over over your models, and you know in in, in the uh, in the past we had you know only only two classes of models, linear and logistic regression. They were actually very very powerful and and good at at making predictions over large scale data sets. Um, but you know they are not the cool cool models anymore. Um, but we launched a couple a couple of new ones uh, this this time around. We launched K-means clustering, so you can actually um, you know build uh, build customer segmentations uh, and do do clustering uh, right in the database. Um, we also launched matrix factorization to to alpha, uh, and. Uh, and that's that's super useful for for recommendations and you know just some initial uh, use cases that we had we took um, like the uh, the Netflix data set from I don't know if you guys remember like a um, 
uh, a few years ago, they offered a million dollar prize for whoever got the best, uh, or whoever could, could beat their, their machine learning. And we just sort of ran it over this untuned um, in, in, our, in our matrix factorization. And you know, it, only took a, it only took a few minutes uh, to, to process all the data. And we also got you know, results that were more or less equivalent to the best published results. And it's not because we're doing anything fancy. It's just, the, it's just because we, we were able to process the whole, the whole thing, is because we had the scale to, to understand the, uh, the full data set. Um, we also have some, um, some DNN uh, neural network models that are in alpha. And, that, and that's, sort of, that's an interesting one, because uh, that's our first one that, under the covers, actually goes out of the database. So these other ones are, are, are building, building things in the database. Uh, we're not moving, moving the data, data out. Um, some of the neural network, like, there's database access patterns are very different than, than sort of the, the access patterns that you need to build a neural network. And so we ship the data over to Cloud Machine Learning Engine under the covers. You don't actually see any of this. It, uh, it, just, it just magically happens, and we'll build the, the neural network for you. But you can imagine that you know, once we can do that, um, then really we can do any, any, uh, any model. So you know, we haven't announced other models, but you know, um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if, uh, if more of them were, were, uh, were impending. Um, and the other one, is, the other one that's, that's, I think is very cool is, is importing, importing TensorFlow models. Um, you can, you know, if you build a TensorFlow model anywhere you want, um, you know, your data science team can build a, build a TensorFlow model um, that does a chatbot. And you can load that into BigQuery and, um, and use that to make predictions and inferences uh, within, within BigQuery. And that actually, that does happen within, within the database. So we can do it, we can do it very fast. Um, and, you know, I think actually this is, you know, I guess this is a challenge to, to, to you folks because the, there's a lot of stuff you can encode in, in, in a TensorFlow model, a lot of kind of, Things that are not just not just machine learning. There, you can encode just about anything. So we're we're hoping people we, people come up with some uh, some interesting uh, use cases just to push on this. Um, AutoML tables was also launched, um, and uh, AutoML tables lets you take a a BigQuery table and you just point it at a BigQuery table. You say this is what I want to this is what I want to predict, and it'll automatically generate a machine learning model for you. So, um, you know, very, very hands-off. And so I mentioned before that we're sort of trying to turn to democratize data analysis and make it, make it possible for more people to, to do data ana analysis. We're also trying to do the same with machine learning because when we talk to, to customers, many of them say, you know, this, you know, we really want to do, we want to do ML, we want to do AI, but I just can't hire anybody that can, that can do that. I just can't find the, I can't find the talent. You know, it's also a really good market for people that you know how to know how to do that stuff. You can you can get get paid very well, um, but we also want to sort of just bring this bring this to more to more people. And you know, you're you're probably somebody who's a machine learning PhD is going to be and deeply understands the data is going to is going to always produce the best models. But um, you can get very very good uh, very good results with with AutoML and and BQML um, with with less work and uh, and uh, less deep understanding of what's going on. Um, so, you know, AutoML and BQML are 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 still different. Um, you know, I'm, I might expect in the in the future for those those things to to start uh, looking similar. That's just a hint. Um, and so we've got you know also um, a number of users that have have really been um, been using ML to to. Uh, and predictive analytics to uh, to really move their business business forwards. So you put all this all this stuff together, and you know uh, I think each one individually is sort of not that different than what a traditional data warehouse can do. You kind of put all these things together, and it starts to look like this is you know this is something more than than um, than your you know your your old old school traditional data warehouse can do. But there's some other differentiators that, and another one that I, I, I want to call out here, and there have been several sessions on VQGIS, um, and I want to mention it again because more data, and as, you know, I was talking about more, lots of data is, is streaming in nature, but also more and more data has a location associated with it. Um, you know, whenever you, hit, you know, all the apps on your phone, or many of the apps on your phone, they collect, they collect location data. 
um, you know, people that have you know, delivery drivers and they want to know the GPS tracks of their delivery drivers. So the kind of the lots and lots of data sets have, have location built into it. And so BQGIS lets you turn that into like what's actually happening in the real world. Let's you turn like, you know, Latin long and, um, and paths and, and these sort of these, you know, just simple points into, into actual interaction with, with the real world. And, you know, many of our customers have been finding um, very, uh, very cool use cases for this. There was, you know, a uh, talk this morning on, you know, Global Fisheries Watch that was looking for, um, for, for, for poachers, poachers using, using geospatial. Um, there's, you know, various transportation boards uh, use it for understanding, understanding traffic flows and traffic patterns. Um, but lots of kind of interesting, interesting ways of using it. And one of the one of the ways that um, that uh, there's a researcher at Google who's who's actually started started to uh, to dig into is 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 to use BQ Geospatial to understand astronomy. And that sounds sort of weird because like. Okay, you know the stars are like are are three D, and you know geospatial is you know is everything is is mapped onto mapped onto the sphere. But if you kind of think of the you know the old school um, uh, old school uh, globes or you know what the you know ancients used to th think of as a celestial sphere, is if you kind of take a point on the Earth and you you go straight up and you see if the, see what the the, the, the intensity is uh, either of you know light or some other um, some other electromagnetic range and um, and you can sort of map you can map that back down onto like where that would be on the earth and once you do that then you can all the calculations that you can do over your uh, over your data set or over geospatial data can be done on these uh, these geographic uh, sorry on the uh, on this astronomical data and so one that you know you know the this is sort of still early, but you know, one idea is looking for exoplanets and looking for you know this is um, so this data set is from um, satellite-based uh, based telescopes, and so the you know when these are three passes of the satellite, and you know so you're looking for exoplanets, you're looking for um, places that are that are you know transit of the exoplanet in front of the in front of the star system, and so you know the uh, anytime you have sort of an unexpected, unexpected dip, unexpected deviation, um, that's sort of an area where you may want to look at um, more closely. So this one in the middle, I'm not saying this is, you know, we found an exoplanet, but like might be something to look, um, look more closely at. Um, so next I'm going to uh, hand it over to, uh, to Rick. Thanks. <laughs> Hi, everyone. So uh, I'm Rick Fulton. I am the senior engineering manager of uh, the simulation platform at Cruise Automation. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about how we use BigQuery at, uh, on the simulation platform. So to introduce the company, Cruise Automation. So uh, we're building self-driving cars. Uh, our mission is that we're building the world's most advanced self-driving vehicles to safely connect people with places, things, and experiences they care about and transform the future of transportation. So for example, we're going to be launching a self-driving rideshare service. So the simulation platform is my team. So I guess to a little context, to build a self-driving car, one way you could do that would be to make code changes and put it on the car and see what happens. Not the most efficient way to do that. Much better to have really accurate simulation systems and to test your code changes on those simulations before you put it on the car. So the simulation platform is all about accelerating uh, and making more efficient the use of simulation. So that means faster simulations, more reliable simulations, uh, being able to run those simulations in more expansive, interesting ways. Uh, and then for the purpose of this uh, presentation, uh, analyze the results of the simulations efficiently. Uh, so again, the goal of my team is within minutes to be able to determine the effect of a code change on the AV's behavior and, uh, and uh, be able to understand where to make improvements if needed. So yeah, again, we are using BigQuery, and I'm going to talk a little bit and touch on the points that, that Jordan was talking about, about some of the data needs we've run into uh, and how uh, BigQuery has helped us. So I guess to start off, uh, we have to handle surprisingly large amounts of data uh, in a real-time way in order for us to do the simulations we want. Um, so we're talking about the number of simulations we're running are generating gigabytes per second, uh, uh, billions of rows a day. Uh, and uh, we, need to be able, we need to have a, a, a data warehouse solutions to be able to support this. 
Uh, the data needs to be available within minutes because we have AV engineers, they run their simulations, they want to know how did, what did it, what's the effect on the car. So they want to have access to that. Uh, and then finally, we've been massively scaling the number of simulations we run, and so we really need a, a solution that is low uh, operational overhead for us. So uh, that went into uh, our selection of BigQuery, which I'll discuss in a minute. Um, for the purpose of the presentation, I just want to dig a little bit into uh, context for typical AV architecture. So this is actually uh, the Udacity self-driving car course uh, architecture they use. So it's not necessarily ours. Um, so on the left, we have sensors. So that's like camera, radar, LIDAR data. Uh, so that's raw input data to the car. It feeds into the perception system. The perception system is all about uh, the car reasoning about where it is in the world, what's around it, like where are the cars around me, where are the people on the bikes. Um, maybe like if there's a car next to me and I see it has a left turn signal, then maybe I will predict that it's going to change lanes, uh, uh, change to a left lane. Um, so that is essentially the state of the world. And then that feeds into the planning system, which is how do I get from point A to point B? How do I, if I need to make an unprotected left turn, how do I make an unprotected left turn safely? How do I go through an intersection uh, four-way stop safely. Uh, and so that all feeds into the control system, which is uh, the low-level controls. How do I actually turn the wheels? Um, so just for some color, uh, I think what's important to note is that we have uh, a ton of different types of testing frameworks. So for instance, oh, right, and uh, so this is a, a picture of, uh, of our web visualization platform. So this basically takes uh, what the car is seeing, and so this is pretty instrumental in building out uh, our simulations. So some of the types of simulations we have, so we have a 2D sim system, so this is like a top-down view where you can see the car executing very man various maneuvers, uh, and you can put cars and other and people and, and just see how the car would react. Uh, there's the same system except it's three-dimensional, and so this is more of a, um, this is more of a, like a full uh, system where we can feed data into the car, into the car within the, within the 3D sim, and the car doesn't know it's within a simulation. So we can see that it's a, kind of like an end-to-end -end integration test. Um, really important would be sensor replay tests. So we want to feed the sensor data into the perception system and make sure that the sensor is, or the perception system is reasoning correctly about the world. So given this radar and LIDAR data, did we accurately identify all the objects around me? Uh, there's also hardware performance, and, uh, and uh, so like hardware performance tests, so how, are we, are we, do we have tests to make sure the hardware is functioning properly? Uh, do we feel confident that the hardware is going to react similarly to what we're running in the cloud? Um, there's many more not uh, worth mentioning uh, in this presentation, but there, the, suffice it to say there's many different types of simulations we run. Um, right, so this is a pretty important point. Simulation testing is hard. It is not your typical regression testing where you have pass-fail tests you run to know if you can merge or deploy. Um, I guess the, the first point to, to talk about is that there's, it's more than binary pass-fail results. So, for instance, you could see a significant decrease in some metric you care about, but that might be okay if you see increases in other metrics that have gone up. So you need to take a more holistic view of all the different uh, metrics. Um, as you could see in the previous uh, couple slides ago, there's many interdependencies in the stack. So if I'm a LiDAR engineer and I'm making a change to a, a segmentation model to identify objects th through LiDAR, I might see that that model is doing fine or doing better than before, but maybe it has some kind of bad downstream effects on some systems, like the planning system. Um, it's really important to understand how I, my current iteration, my current commit is doing in relation to previous commits. So I want to see, uh, you know, given a metric, uh, am I doing better compa compared to base or compared over time? Um, and then finally, we want to be pretty flexible about being able to add new metrics. So if I'm an AV engineer and I decide that it's useful to compute some new derived metric, uh, we need a data solution that can handle that uh, without having to do kind of an onerous uh, uh, data uh, schema migration. Um, I'm going to briefly talk through our old architecture. Uh, there's some obvious issues with it, so I, it's not worth spending too much time on, but you have a code change, it goes into GitHub, we have our CI system kick off, request the standard set of regression tests and simulations, they get scheduled and run, we have some kind of graph compute engine that will um, change those results into uh, Avro, and we use Avro as our data serialization method to put those Avro tables into S3. Um, so the main point here is that we just had raw Avro tables. There's no querying layer, so there's really not a ton we can do here. Uh, 
So there's many types of queries we can answer. We can't, we can't do average detection accuracy over a test run or average of, over time or specific metrics over time. There's really not a lot we can do. All, all of that aggregation has to happen on the front end, so a significant memory and CPU burden. Uh, doesn't really scale at all with the number of increasing simulations, and it's really time-consuming to build front-end analysis tools because they're so uh, bespoke and, or bespoke to what we're actually or to for, to the particular uh, use case. Okay, so we chose BigQuery, um, and the difference here is that okay, well we moved to GCS, which was cool um, from S3, but also when we load those tables into GCS, then we uh, use via a pub sub. We send a signal to this uh, simple ingestion service, which will do some of the ETL to put it into BigQuery, including abstracting away, adding a new column so that the, or a new table into BigQuery so that the, the AV engineer doesn't have to worry about that. So it's all taken care of for us, and we've just been able to feed tons of data into BigQuery. Um, so there's been applications that now we can do things we couldn't do before, so direct queries, Jupyter Notebooks, BI tools, uh, Looker Tableau, and uh, I'm going to give a specific example. We built out this front-end analysis platform. And uh, so I'm going to talk about one specific AV metric and uh, the, the tool we built on top of BigQuery now that we have this data in there. So this is, uh, this is an unprotected left turn, very important maneuver. So um, what this metric is is the selected gap metric, which is a, the time it takes between when the car enters the intersection and makes the left turn and when the oncoming car enters the intersection. So it's very important to make sure that this time is, there's a, a good cushion here. You don't want to make an unsafe left turn. So in this case, in this second picture here, that's when the car enters, and you can see what, whatever that time is up there. And then when the car enters the intersection, that's about five seconds later. So we want to make sure that there's a good cushion no matter what speed the car is coming, no matter how, what the headway is between those two cars, so how much, how much temporal distance there is between car two and car one. So uh, you might think that we want to have a, simu or a series of simulations that not just test this in this particular scenario, but what if the cars are going faster? What if, what if they're closer together? Are we still going to make the right decisions? So that's exactly what we did. Um, this is built directly on top of BigQuery. Um, a lot going on in this slide, but in what we're doing here is that we're comparing uh, against the, we have our feature branch, we're compar a feature branch we're comparing against base, and um, what we're doing here is uh, each, th these axes, so one axis is the car speed, the oncoming car speed, and the other one is headway uh, time, and so we want to make sure that as we modulate these values that we're still having a nice healthy uh, gap length, selected gap length. And so, Interesting point here, each one of these cells is itself a simulation, like a full simulation that takes a lot of time to run, generating at least a gigabyte of data. Um, and so we're basically pulling all of this data easily into BigQuery, and we have very powerful tools that allow us to analyze you know, how we're doing, how features doing against base, and where we still have to improve. Uh, so yeah, um, we had some really good results so far. So. Um, we are ingesting something like half a million rows, a million rows, gigabytes per second. Uh, the data is available within minutes, uh, and it's scaled actually literally 10x since growth. We, we uh, looked at the numbers, and uh, it was the number 10. So um, we've been very happy with this, and um, we expect to scale this another order of magnitude or two. So we're not quite at the limits that Jordan was talking about, but um, we've had no problems ingesting a pretty considerable amount of data so that we can be much more efficient about how we're doing AV development. Uh, so yeah, in the future, we're going to continue to scale the number of simulations where we are targeting an order of magnitude or two. Um, so we believe that BigQuery will be able to support that. Uh, we're going to continue to expand the simulation tooling we have and, uh, and uh, work, work, on more, yeah, work on more of the simulation tooling. Um, we might be uh, looking at external data storage that Jordan mentioned uh, for certain kinds of simulations that have particularly large outputs. And uh, we're, we're most likely going to be using some kind of ML application here. Like, we might want to take all the data that's in BigQuery and uh, use that, build some model to predict on-road performance given the metrics that we compute from the, simulations, uh, from the simulation performance. So that'd be really cool. So thank you, everyone. <laughs>